When we think about Holy Week, many times we think about Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, and everything in between gets a little bit fuzzy. Last Sunday began what Christians call Holy Week. It's the week that leads us into Easter. It's a journey that begins with a royal welcome, leads to betrayal, and ends with an empty tomb. Today we will walk through each day of Holy Week using a variety of lenses to tell the greatest story ever told. We will begin on Sunday and end on Friday, reflecting on the life, the events, and the experience of Jesus Christ. We will use different teaching styles, first-person perspective, video, historical context, devotional, teaching through using our senses, and a shared or mutual participation through the elements of communion. Like me, I'm sure you are anticipating the joy of Sunday, but you don't get the joy of Sunday without the pain of Friday. That is where we will end today. The job in front of you today is to experience the weight, depth, and fullness of what Jesus has done for you. When we finish, you are more than welcome to stay for a while or leave, but we ask that you remain silent until you are outside of the auditorium doors. We invite you to come back this weekend for our Easter service as we celebrate victory and the fulfillment of God's promise. Sunday is coming. The endless expanse of the universe. As we look at the stars on a cloudless night, our eyes only see a fraction, just a sampling of what is actually out there beyond this. Billions of galaxies swirling with stars. Our universe, in a word, is huge. The scriptures say that God brought the stars into existence with a word, with just an exhale of a breath. It says that God measures the universe with the span of his hand. So how big does that make God? How small does that make us? It's hard to comprehend. Such scale evokes awe and wonder, but it also brings thoughts of a distant God a million miles away. A giant God who cannot be bothered with the details of our lives. But perhaps the wonder of God lies not just in his bigness, but it lies also in his smallness. The same God who set the earth in motion around the sun is the same God who puts particles in motion around the nucleus. The same God that swirled the galaxies created swirls on the tips of your fingers. The same God that created this massive universe is the same God who sent a tiny little baby to save it. God stepped out of heaven. His love demonstrated by the distance he is willing to travel. joy to pain, from life to death. He became like us. And today, Jesus enters Jerusalem small. He enters with humility, not pomp or power. He became small to become close. Today is Sunday.
Welcome to the Mount of Olives. On the screen here, you're going to see a picture. It's the eastern side of Jerusalem. Before us is the Kidron Valley down below. Up there where the Dome of the Rock is, is Mount Moriah. Up and to the left, you see is Mount Zion, City of David. And there down to the right is the Garden of Gethsemane. That's today in Jerusalem. Let's go back 2,000 years. You're standing again on the Mount of Olives. Up here on the hill, the, the valley down below is the Kidron Valley. Mount Moriah, where the Dome of the Rock is today, is where the temple is 2,000 years ago. Up there to the left is Mount Zion, the city of David, the Garden of Gethsemane down there to the right. And this road that you see going into Jerusalem is the road that you can walk today is the road of Jesus took on Palm Sunday. Now behind us to the southeast just a little bit is the city of Bethany. Now Jesus has been staying here a few days for the last few nights at the homes of Mary and Martha. Now Jerusalem was an exciting time of year uh, with Passover during these festivals. Jerusalem is normally around 40,000 people, but because of Passover, it can grow up to six times the amount of people. Huge. A lot of people. Now, um, many of us know the story of Jesus entering Jerusalem, but some, sometimes I think we miss the significance of the events. Now, in fact, Jesus' entry was not the only parade into Jerusalem. Now, on the other side, on the west side on here, Pontius Pilate, who was the governor, had a parade as well. But it was an imperial royal parade to come into the city. With all the Jews coming in, six times the amount, 200,000 people on there, the Romans get nervous. The Jewish leaders get nervous. So Pontius Pilate, who lived in Caesarea Maritime on the Mediterranean Ocean, uh, would come to Jerusalem to show that the Romans still have power. So he came in on the other side of the city, marching as a parade through there. Imagine the uh, imagery of that. Imagine hundreds of soldiers, chariots. Um, imagine the soldiers, the military a parade of strength and might. The drums drumming the beats going through the city up and down. Now take the, in, the entry of Jesus. Jesus intentionally set himself up in contrast with the other procession, other procession coming into town. The event was sort of like a counter procession designed to contrast the kingdom of Rome with the dominion of God. Now, Jesus rode in Jerusalem on a young colt, coming in love and peace, the Romans on war horses, coming as power. Now, the crowds with extreme joy with Jesus, waving the palm branches, it would be seen as a symbol to both the Roman leaders and the Jewish leaders as a sign of rebellion. They are shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. The word Hosanna meaning, God, rescue me. And we'd like to think that, man, they, after Jesus' three years of ministry, they finally get it. They now realize that who he truly is, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. But no, to them, he is a political leader. He is coming to cleanse the temple, to overthrow the Romans. That's the palm branches. Years earlier, Solomon, when he entered the, the city, palm branches represented victory. They wanted earthly solutions to earthly problems. And Jesus, amid the celebration, he looked at the city. He looked at the city and looked at the people around him and wept in the middle of people shouting joy. Why did he cry? Why did he weep? Because he knew what was yet about to come. And he loved the city. He loved the people. And those same people, a week later, would reject him. Many times, we are those same people. One minute, we're yelling and praises to God, singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to God in the highest. And a week later, with our actions, and sometimes our words, we're yelling, crucify him. Palm Sunday is about choosing to enter into a week-long mystery as we journey to the cross and declare the hypocrisy in our own heart. And instead of running from it, we embrace it because God embraced it. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and he went to the temple. Then after looking around at everything, he went back up the road to Bethany for the night with the 12 disciples because it was already late.
Monday. It's the day after Jesus entered the city, almost as a hero, with lots of shouts of praise and fanfare, but that was never his purpose. You see, Jesus had explained his purpose several times in the years leading up to this moment. He shared things like, I have come into this world to testify the truth. I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. I've come to seek and save the lost. So now Jesus walks into the temple this Monday before Easter with the same purpose in mind, to save the lost, to show the people that he is God's rescue plan. 
Let's set the context. It's Passover. It's a feast. It's a celebration of when God liberated the Israelites from the Egyptian slavery. And as the custom, people sacrificed in the temple. But during this celebration time, there were many visitors, and they came and didn't have a sacrifice, and so they needed to purchase one. Well, people saw this as a way to make money. And so first, the common currency that was used in that day was considered unclean. It was not to be used in the temple. And so they were told, this is dirty and you need to tur turn it into temple money. And there was a fee associated with that exchange. But then they were able to purchase items for the Passover sacrifice at inflated prices. The temple had become a place of corrupt commercialism. And so here's where we join the story. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. You know, we often picture Jesus as this sacrificial lamb, loving, patient, enduring, kind, long-suffering. And that's accurate and true. Jesus is our sacrificial lamb. He is infinite in love and mercy and grace. But you know, the Bible also describes him as a lion and mighty and king of kings. He says, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. So in this frenzied atmosphere in the temple, you can imagine that Jesus was not using his inside voice. Tables are flipped over, people are trying to collect their sale items, money scattered around, animals are scared, people are staring in disbelief, and the priests and the teachers of the law are wondering, what is going on? And then they hear Jesus' words. My house will be called a house of prayer. And immediately they connect. The teachers of the law and the priests know the scripture of what Jesus is speaking of in Isaiah. They've read it many times before. You see, Isaiah was describing a place, a desire of God, where there is safety and love and community and his blessing. But then Jesus says it, but. But you are making it a den of thieves. Immediately again, they connect with that scripture from the prophet Jeremiah. You see, Jeremiah is talking to the Israelites about their wicked behavior and their false acts of piety in God's temple. Yet even in, in Jesus' righteous anger, he, we see him still caring for people. It says in the scriptures, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. So even in this moment, there are still people coming to him and he is still caring for them. He is healing them right in front of the leaders. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Indignant. Indignant means that they're mad about something that is happening that is unjust. What is unjust here? Are they mad that the temple has been turned into a yard sale? That they are supposed to be protecting the temple? Are they mad because Jesus is healing the blind and the lame at this time? No, they're not mad at those things. They were mad that the children were praising him. They said, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said, yeah. Haven't you ever read? And when Jesus says, haven't you ever read, he actually is saying, you are so smart and you are so studied yet you have totally missed it. You have totally missed it. Jesus says, from the lips of children and infants, you have called forth your praise. Jesus is quoting Psalm 8. And if I can just read the first two verses in Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have called forth your praise. You see, just days before Jesus is going to head to the cross, he is still reminding the people. 
I am God. I'm the one who deserves the praise. I'm the one who was written about hundreds of years ago. I am the one you're waiting for. Do not miss who I am and why I came. Tuesday, and Jesus came actively, intentionally, 
seeking to love his community. So on Tuesday, he was returning back to the place where he had his righteous anger moment. A place where was misused, a house of prayer. And so Jesus returning to go to the temple to speak and be with the community. And at that moment, he was cornered. Cornered by pastors, community leaders, and elders. And so they shifted over to a space, a porch, right beside the temple. People peered to watch, seeing that there was something up. And they asked a question, a very bold question. What credentials do you have? What authority have you been given? And it wasn't just the moment that when he was angry the day before, but because of healing and claiming that he is coming from heaven, from God. These men, they were challenged. And so Jesus responds with a question of his own. Before I answer my question, let me ask you this. Where did John the Baptist get his credentials? Did it come from the heavens or did it come from the humans? These men turned to each other, didn't know how to respond because they knew, wow. If John the Baptist did for sure get it from heaven, these men did not see John the Baptist as a paving way for Jesus the Messiah. And so if they called Jesus out on that moment, they would lose their credentials because the crowds believed in John the Baptist. And the crowds looked at these men as gods, people who lived a righteous life, people who knew the law like no other. And from the other end, if he gave it from humans, well, where did he get it from? Who gave it to him? What credentials? What schooling did he get? And so, with an awkward pause, they returned with a response. We don't know. And so Jesus continued, well, then I have no answer for you on where my authority comes from. With that response, Jesus started to tell them stories. See, Jesus used stories to connect with people. He did it all the time. And I love that because he uses the stories to connect with people because their story exists and matters. Every story in this world exists to matter. So then Jesus continues on. As he continues to connect with these community leaders, he tells them three stories. And after and through the time he's sharing these stories, and by the time he finishes the third one, these men realize that Jesus is calling them out. He's calling their bluff. That these men who saw themselves as righteous, as men who thought that they had it all together, were missing the point. See, Jesus came from heaven to bring a different kind of community, a new community. He was trying to bring heaven back to earth, to reunite the relationship with God and man and man and God. These men who claimed to have it all together where people looked at them as gods. They used their platform to be using people so that they could be glorified for their own personal gain. While well, Jesus used his platform to be walking with people in their needs. 
See, Jesus was looking for the one. The one who was lost, the one who was marginalized, the one who's not accounted for, the one who has deep tragedy. While these men looked out for themselves, me, myself. Jesus cared for men and women who were walking through terrible tragedy, hardships, diseases, illnesses. And all these men cared about were themselves. See, Jesus' challenging words, not only were they intense, but he was actually inviting them in when he mentioned this moment. He goes, guys, don't you get it? You could be actively pouring into your community. There's people who are lost, who are hurting, who need you. They look up to you. They need love, and yet you avoid it. You subsidize it with your sermonizing, and you look for the church attendance to make you feel like what? Worth it, value, powerful. Jesus was willing to leave the 99 for the one. And these men were not willing to leave the 99 for the one. Because all they cared about was themselves. Because Jesus cares for the one, and these men were not looking out for the others, they didn't like that. And at this moment, even though they had built a list of reasons why they hated Jesus and they wanted him to be gone, at this current time, it began to shift as they started a game plan and the betrayal came soon that would set up this horrific tragedy in our time. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, we
faultless stand before the throne. And Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love. And through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of Well, here we go on Thursday morning. It's been quite an incredible week. I'm sure the, the 12 disciples, can you imagine 12 young adult men experiencing what they experienced that week, that huge Palm Sunday, Hosanna run, then Jesus ripping through the temple on Monday, going face to face with all the big guns on Tuesday, and um, just maybe it was, it's adrenaline that's running, I don't know, but, but on, on Thursday, so many times we think, wow, it was the last supper, then he went off to the garden. But no, 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 with Jesus, there was so much that Jesus packed in to his final moments with his most beloved disciples, his Christ followers, the ones that have walked with him for three and a half years. 
and I'm so amazed at Jesus, and there's so much that I, I need to learn from his life. Jesus knew what was going to happen in 24 hours. He, he knew everything was going to break loose. He knew about the false accusations, the terrible torture, the horrific pain, the execution by the Romans that was going to happen. And yet Jesus, instead of making a plan B, rallying his disciples, hey, let's call the police. You know what? I need a lawyer, you know? Um, Jesus was calm and cool and collected. And his obedience to his heavenly father, his obedience and his faith in his heavenly father, that sets the example for all of us, just made Jesus, instead of freaking out, Decide to love well and to serve well and to minister well. And um, Jesus, in the morning when they got up, he sent in Peter and John. He said, hey, guys, go into Jerusalem. Let's get ready for Passover. Because you know what? This Passover thing is an incredible celebration. If you were a good Jew, you made it into Jerusalem. And as Tim shared earlier, probably over 200,000 people packed into this city of only about 40,000. And the disciples said, well, Jesus, where do you want us to prepare this Passover? And Jesus says, you know what? You're going to find somebody carrying a water pot. Follow the man. And then he'll take you to the house. Talk to the master of the house and say, hey, hey, um, the teacher has need for a room. Do you have one for us? Could you imagine what's going through Peter's head and John's head? Really, Jesus, that's the game plan? But okay, here we go. And they went, and it just all clicked. Just like Jesus said, even though it didn't make earthly sense. And all of a sudden, before they knew it, they're in a room, and, and they're preparing this room for Jesus and their other 10 friends to show up. And, and when evening was coming and it was time for supper, Jesus and the other 10 showed up in the upper room. And um, in, in the upper room, they're, they're all getting down at the table. And back then, they didn't have tables and chairs. They would kind of lay down and, or sit up on an elbow, and, and they were kind of laid around, around the tables. And, and that, that, that was just that custom at that time. So, ah, but now there's an awkward moment. There's an awkward moment because normally the servant, the lowliest person in the house, had the job to wash the feet of the guests that came in. But since there, this is a guest room, there's nobody there to do it. I'm sure the disciples looked at each other. I'm not going to do it. You do it. Why don't you do it? You know, because, and all of a sudden, Jesus gets up, takes off his robe, wraps himself with a towel, and he gets down, and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. Here is the master, the teacher, serving his students. And at the end of the time together, Jesus said, you know what? You guys call me teacher and master, and hey, you're right. But just like you saw me serve you, so I want you to serve others. It's incredible because this get-together, this dinner that was going to be the Passover meal because they are celebrating the deliverance of, of, of that God had for the children of Israel when they got out of Egypt and they headed off to the promised land. That's what this Passover is all about. But Jesus, this family meal with his 12 comrades, man, it's going to get intense. There's going to be ups and downs in this four to five, six hour meal conversation going on. And it's incredible because 2,018 years later, as I read in the Gospel of John, the conversations Jesus had with his disciples, I'm like, oh, my stars, this is for me today. Because Jesus was telling his disciples, guess what, guys? I'm going to be heading out. I'm going to be going away. And his disciples are starting to freak out. And Jesus says, hey, don't let your heart be troubled. You know, you believe in God, believe in me. Hey, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place. If I prepare a place, I'm going to come back and get you. I'm going to bring you back to heaven with me. And, and, and Thomas, he's been hanging with Jesus, the son of God, for three years. Thomas says, hey, how do we get there again? And um, Jesus said, you know what, Thomas? I am the resurrection and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Jesus then went on to say, you know what, guys? The world doesn't like me. And since the world doesn't like me, if you're a Christ follower, the world's not going to like you either. But Jesus just didn't leave him there. Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to be a helper. The Holy Spirit's going to give you strength. The Holy Spirit's going to help you get through your struggles, through your jobs, through your relationships, through what to do in everyday life. And even Jesus even said in, in one portion of Scripture, he says, you know what? The peace that I'm going to give you is not like the world gives. What the world gives is temporary. What I give you is just an unexplainable peace that you know you're doing the right thing when you're in relationship with Jesus. 
Jesus even then went on to say, you know what? Hey, I'm the vine. You guys are the branches. Just abide in me. Just stay connected to me. You guys are going to have some rough times as well, but just stay. And you know what? A vine produce, a branch produces incredible fruit and grapes and fruit, but yet the branch really is only a conduit. And the, the, the branch is only a conduit of, 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 of what it's connected to in the vine. So Jesus is encouraging them, stay connected to the vine, guys. Dan needs to remember that so much in 2018 with life and health, family, marriage, jobs. Dan, stay connected to the vine. And then Jesus goes on and, and he prays an incredible prayer. He prays a prayer over his disciples. He's like, God, protect them. He doesn't say, God, keep them safe. God, he doesn't pray, God, make it easy on them. He says, God, guard their hearts and their souls and their minds as they, as they live for me with passion and purpose. And yes, Jesus did have the Passover meal. And there was that time where Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. I'm sure some of the disciples are scratching their heads. What do you mean your body broken? He grabs a cup and says, this is my cup poured out, the, the blood that was poured out for you. And also, even during the supper time, guess what? Uh, Jesus said, you guys are going to betray me. And they're all freaking out. Who, me, not me, no way. And even Peter says, I'm never going to do it. And Jesus says, hey, before, before the rooster crows, man, you're going to deny me three times. Judas takes off and leaves the room, and we all know the story. So we, ah, Judas is going. Why don't they quick jump on Judas? They didn't know where Judas was going. They thought maybe he's going to go help somebody in need, get some more supplies for the supper. From their perspective, Judas was a good guy. They didn't know how Satan had entered into his heart and began to influence him. But Jesus, taking the bread and the cup, said, guys, do this in remembrance of me. And as a church body right now, we're going to do this and remembrance of Jesus. And if you know Jesus Christ and you're a Christ follower, this is an incredible time of celebration and remembrance and gratefulness for what he's done. If you've never made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ, tonight can be your night. Or you say, Jesus, I don't get this whole God thing, but, but I know I, I mess up and I sin. God, I believe you died and rose again. And God, I want to commit my life to you. Just that simple prayer can be your first step to starting an incredible life with Jesus this Easter weekend. But as our ushers come, and they're going to get ready and in place. Um, they're going to be dismissing you by rows. Some of you will come forward. Some of you will go backward. So please listen to your ushers. And there's a table in front and behind each section. And once you grab a cup and you grab a little wafer, and there's some gluten alternatives, uh, if, if you desire that at the table as well. But you're going to go around to the other side of your row and go in and have a seat. And I'm going to ask that you hold the cup of juice and hold the piece of bread, and we're going to take it all together. So ushers at this time, please feel free to dismiss your rows. Son to pray. 
purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree and so that rugged cross my salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out Hallelujah, praise and honor unto Thee. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me who the sun sets free oh is free indeed now my debt is paid it is paid in full by the precious blood that my jesus oh, spilled my now jesus the
this is my body broken for you take eat in remembrance of me and these disciples another word could be a Christ follower Christ follower is that the person you are today because that's the invitation where he says this is my blood as he took the cup my blood that was shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. My blood is going to give you a fresh start, a new start for generations to come. Drink this in remembrance of me. Let's drink it together. And after that, they, they sang a few songs. They, they walked out to the Mount of Olives where the Garden of Gethsemane was located. It's probably pretty late night. Maybe it's pushing 11, 12, maybe even early in the morning. Remember, they've had an exhausting week. Adrenaline running like crazy with ups and downs and all these young men saying, hey, we're with Jesus. And um, he walks to the garden where, where God's word says where many times Jesus would meet with them and pray with them. And Judas is gone. They don't know what Judas is up to. Jesus does. And Jesus goes there anyway. He, he has eight of his disciples kind of sit and say, hey, pray for me. He takes another three, Peter, James, and John, his closest buddies, man. Over three years, he's had special experience with them. And he takes them, and, 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 it's, and it says that Jesus said, my soul is in anguish. Peter, James, and John, my soul is in anguish, and I'm troubled. I'm troubled to the point of death. Will you guys please sit here and pray for me? Just pray for me. That's all I ask. Don't ask for much. Jesus walks a few feet away, and he then just, 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 just drops to his knees, and he's saying, Abba, Father, all things, to his heavenly Father, all things are possible. Please remove this cup. Please. I don't want to go through what I have to go through. But he says, not my will, your will. Jesus goes back to his support group, these three guys, and they're asleep. He says, guys, wake up. Come on, please. Just, just pray for me a little bit more. Just don't fall asleep. Pray. And Jesus walks over. And this time as he's crying out to God, his, his capillaries are bursting under his skin. And blood is starting to pour out of, 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 the, of the pores of his skin. Because of the high stress, the high anxiety of what a human body can handle. He comes back to the disciples and they're sleeping and he just leaves them and he goes back and three times he cries out to God, Father, remove it. But Jesus, an incredible example of obedience no matter what. Incredible example of faith. I'm going to trust in my perfect heavenly Father no matter what. He says, not my will, but yours. Goes back to his disciples Peter, James, and John fast asleep. The other seven are fast asleep. He wakes them up, and as the words are in his mouth of, hey, it's time to wake up, time to get up, the time is at hand. 
he locks eyes with Judas. It's Friday. It's Friday. Jesus with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. As Judas approaches, he is not alone. He comes with Jewish religious leaders. He comes with many Roman soldiers. And then he betrays Jesus with a kiss, signifying that this is the man to take. In those moments, Jesus asked the guards, he asked the soldiers, who are you here for? And they tell him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus' response is, I am he. And at the voice of Jesus, the armies stagger backwards and fall over. Jesus will go, but it will be of his own accord. In that moment, Peter being Peter, grabs a sword and takes a swing at one of the high priest's assistants and lops off an ear. Jesus picks it up off of the ground, heals the man and tells, tells Peter, put away your swords. Once again, Peter has misunderstood the moment as many around him have. Jesus is taken. That night he would be, have three trial of sorts. None of these trials would be actually legal. In fact, they would be a mockery. During the last trial, he, he's before the Sanhedrin, and they ask him, are you the Son of God? And he says, it is as you say. Jesus says that not only is he the Son of God, but he is the long-awaited Messiah. Now, this would have been blasphemy to the Jews of the time, and they moved to kill him. Now, having no way to kill him themselves, they take him to the Romans and ask them to do it. He'll be, he'll be taken before the governor, Pontius Pilate, and then he'll be taken before the ruler, Herod Antipas. And Pilate will ask, are you the king of the Jews? And Herod wants Jesus to perform miracles, but neither one of these men know who Jesus truly is. When he is returned back, to Pontius Pilate, it's the custom of Pilate to release one of the prisoners during the Passover celebration. Before him, there are two prisoners, Jesus and the terrorist Barabbas. Well, beforehand, the, the Jewish rulers, they, they stir up the crowd to get them to release Barabbas instead of Jesus. And as Barabbas is released, Pilate asks, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And the crowd says, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And so Pilate agrees, and he releases Jesus to be scourged and then crucified. Jesus, the creator of the universe, the life giver, the sovereign and powerful God, is chained to a pole. His clothing is stripped off, and he is beaten with a whip. Now, this whip would have been comprised of several different uh, cords of leather, and into the leather there were pieces of bone and metal. Now, the sanitized version sometimes of Good Friday, we, we avert our eyes from what Jesus went through, but in these moments, he was whipped and as he was whipped, those pieces of metal and bone would have torn into his flesh, peeling it off of his body, revealing muscle and bone as God bled. The, the scene would have been horrific. If you can imagine someone that you love deeply being tortured so profoundly, it's hard to wrap our brains around why God would ever let himself go through that if it were not for love of his people love of us. And then they led Jesus back to the guards. And the guards put a purple cloak over him. And they gave him a phony scepter. And they, for, they, they, they formed a, a crown of thorns. These thorns, some of them could have been as long as 6 to 12 inches. And they fixed it on his head. And the thorns dug in deep as he bled. And they punched him and they mocked him, hurling insults at God himself. 
Hail, King of the Jews. And then they led Jesus out to be crucified. By now, Jesus could hardly stand, beaten, bleeding, hungry. They lashed a crossbeam to his back and whipped him out into the streets. It was late in the morning when they arrived at Golgotha, the hill of the skull. All of his disciples had left, save one. John was there. Along with John, Jesus' mother Mary and other women had not left his side. And then they began to crucify him. They drove the spikes through his wrist, a pain that would have been amazing. Beyond just the, 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 the wound in the flesh, there's a nerve that would radiate pain through his entire arm. And then they drove a spikes into his feet. And then they brought him up. And standing upright in that moment, the weight of his body would pull on his hands and the spikes that were driven in his wrist. It would have been unbearable. And in those moments, as he leaned forward, his shoulders and his elbows would have been dislocated from his body after hanging for moments in agonizing and excruciating pain. Crucifixion, you died of asphyxiation. Literally, in that position, you would not be able to get air. So as Jesus pulled himself up on the nails driven through his wrist, he would gulp for breath. And even in those moments, as Jesus was dying, he had words, surprising words, words for the people around him. Even the men that were crucifying him, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. As Jesus hung between two thieves, one of the, the, the thieves asked Jesus, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responds, truly, I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Now in these moments, God places the sin of the world upon Jesus' shoulders as he becomes the final sacrifice for the sins of the world. And as all of God's anger and wrath for sin and wrongdoing are poured upon Jesus' shoulder, the innocent sacrifice on our behalf in those moments, Jesus felt something that he had never felt before. Separation from God the Father. In those moments, the only time in all of eternity that Jesus would be truly alone. And in those moments, he cried out to God, no longer saying, Father, but saying, My God, why? Why have you forsaken me? As Jesus continued in pain, it's easy to say that Jesus died for my sins, but we forget this moment as he is dying in agony. When we make light of Jesus' death, we lose an understanding of the great love it demonstrates. So as we contemplate the, the death that Jesus is dying on our behalf, we see through the blood, the tears, the mess, we see His love. And on the cross, He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He died the death that we deserved. That is the high cost of our forgiveness. And in those moments, knowing that he had accomplished all that he came to do, dying on our behalf for all that would put faith in him, he said, it is finished. Finally, summing up the last bit of power that his body had, he once again spoke to his father and he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And after he had said that, Jesus breathed his last. The gospel writers record that in that moment when Jesus died, the, the sky was dark and the earth quaked and the rocks split and the temple had a veil and it was torn from top to bottom when Jesus died. And that evening his body was placed in the tomb and a stone was rolled over the entrance. Jesus God. Jesus was betrayed by those closest to him. 
He was abandoned by his friends in his deepest moment of need, and he was crushed by people that claimed to love God. There is no greater love than what we see on the cross, no greater love than a man laid down his life for his friends. And the glory of the cross is that through faith in what Jesus has done on it, we may call ourselves friends of God. Jesus was murdered to pay the price for our sins and to purchase our redemption. Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. The way of freedom was forged by the cross, and for all those who trust in him, new life is found in his death. It is Friday. Jesus is dead. Darkness covers the land. But you need not say goodbye. You need not say goodbye. The people will shout my name. Pilate will tell them there's nothing I've done to deserve this, but they will refuse. Pilate will stay me beside Barabbas, a murderer, and they will choose him over me. Pilate will appeal to the priest, insist on simply whipping me to appease their fury, but they will shout it louder, crucify, crucify. But still, you need not say goodbye. My hands will be tied to a post. The sound of the whip will ring in your ears and in your chest. The soldiers will peel the skin off my back. A ring of thorny branches will be pressed into my scalp until the blood runs into my eyes. Oh, but listen. You need not say goodbye. I will carry that cross. I will go to the place of the skull and there they will drive the iron stakes between the bones in my wrist with a hammer that will nail my feet into the tree. I will be raised up as the world waits for me to die. Nevertheless, you need not say goodbye. Between two thieves I will hang. You may hear me speaking to my father your father. You may hear me ask him, why? But child, you need not say goodbye. What you won't see, what you won't hear, what you won't know until all of this is done is that in that moment, I was paying the penalty of your wrongdoing, every wrongdoing, every mistake, Every act of envy, every word of hatred, every moment of violence and greed and spite, every selfish desire, every lustful thought, every moment of weakness and weariness, all the failures of human history will be in my hands and on my head. On that cross, I will suffer the wrath that was destined for you. Every guilty verdict fallen on me, your punishment will be paid for in my blood and it will be enough. I will die on your cross. I will let out a final sigh. Know that I have loved you and you need not say goodbye. Oh, 
your grace so free washes over me you have made my chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore he cancelled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested in my life began oh oh your grace so Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. <laughs>